Welcome to our hometown. My guest is E. Gifford Stack. I call him Colonel Stack. He's a Vietnam veteran. He went back to Vietnam 50 years after being there in 1968. So stay tuned with us as we explore our hometown with Colonel E. Gifford Stack. My guest is E. Gifford Stack. I call him Colonel Stack. Mm -hmm. uh, he has some great stories for us today. Uh, Colonel, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jim. Pleasure to be uh, here. We're going to spend a, a good bit of our time today talking about Vietnam and your visit to Vietnam 50 years after having been there as, a, as an Air Force officer, uh, well, all those years ago. It was uh, very unique. Uh, my wife and I uh, went to Vietnam, my second trip, her first trip. Uh, 50 years ago to the year that I was stationed at Benoit Air Force Base. Uh, Benoit is about 15 miles uh, northeast of Saigon. It's the largest uh, Air Force Base in uh, Vietnam. And I went there for 13 months in 1968 and 69. Well, let's talk about your experience then for just a moment or two, and then we'll fast forward uh, 50 years. <laughs> um, you were a young Air Force officer. <laughs> Very young with hair. <laughs> uh, back then, and I was the base civic action officer. And uh, basic, tell, tell our viewers what that involves. Basically, that was part of the pacification program, part of winning the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. Obviously, we had a very strong military presence there with our aircraft, but the goal of the base civic action office, myself and an NCO, was to work with schools and orphanages, uh, churches, uh, some agricultural projects in order to supplement and help and aid uh, as best we could be that with uh, manpower, uh, materials, or in some cases, uh, money. So on a typical day, you're out and about in the community, doing community development. Yes, uh, community relations, community development, and it was kind of uh, unique because, uh, as many of your viewers may know, Tet happened in February of 68, and I arrived in country in October. Uh, by that time, the town of Benoit was completely off limits. In other words, the base was closed, and I was one of the few people um, that had the uh, opportunity and the privilege to go off base and intermingle. I see. I see. Very unique. Um, you were there a year, more or less? Uh, Thirteen months. Okay. Uh, Thirteen months. And uh, I'd like to think back that uh, we did uh, some good. Um, but it was a, a challenging assignment. Sure. And uh, I, I did volunteer for that tour. Um, I wanted to go and experience that firsthand for myself. My brother was a Vietnam veteran. He was a pilot. And uh, I wanted to go and uh, put my time in Vietnam. Good for you. Uh, you came back in good health? I did. Um, I don't know if you know, but of the 2.7 million people that participated in country or offshore in the Vietnam War, only 20% were actually in combat. Right. Uh, the rest of the 80%, including myself, uh, we were support, logistics, administrative uh, roles. So uh, I never saw direct combat, but that said, our base uh, was rocketed sure. about every other week with rockets or mortars and that usually happened it did happen at night and that sent you scurrying from your um, hooch as we call them into the bunker very fast um, you stayed with the Air Force all those years as a reserve officer uh, when I came back from Vietnam I had one more year left on my active duty assignment and I finished up at an air base in uh, Syracuse Mm -hmm. New York, uh, 25th Air, 21st Air Division, and then I separated, um, got out for almost four years, and did some international traveling in uh, Australia and New Zealand, and then uh, got the opportunity when I came back to the United States to join a reserve uh, unit, which I right. did at McCord Air Force Base outside of uh, Seattle, Washington. I, fi I find myself moving chronologically. Uh, tell our viewers briefly about it. Your, your primary working career outside of uh, your Air Force commitment? When I came back uh, to the United States, um, I experienced something that I'd never done before, and that was uh, work with a company 
that organize paper drives. And some of your viewers may be familiar with a paper drive where you got your uh, church or your school or your civic organization to save old newspapers. Sure, sure. And then, this was before the days of curbside recycling, and then uh, you'd pick a date, usually a Saturday, and everybody would bring their paper in, and then that trailer full of paper would go off to a mill to be reprocessed. But that led to a 30 or so year in recycling. Uh, that was my start. Uh, as an executive. Right. Uh, sure. Started in Seattle and then uh, went to Washington, D.C., and headed up uh, the Glass Packaging Institute recycling program for the United States, and then uh, worked with the National Soft Drink Association as their vice president of environmental affairs with the emphasis on recycling. We could do a separate interview on that, <laughs> couldn't we? <laughs> we probably could. Okay. Uh, we're moving now to your most recent uh, trip to Vietnam. Um, it was a three-week trip. Uh, you designed your own itinerary. Yes, I had uh, a desire to go back because um, I, I knew that Vietnam not only was beautiful geographically, uh, but the people were. I, I had the greatest admiration and respect uh, for them. And obviously, when I was there in the 60s, it was a very challenging time for everybody. And I wanted to go back under different circumstances. So I looked at possibly taking a cruise. And I didn't like that there were so few ports that you actually uh, called on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I looked at a land tour, and I didn't like that because it, it seemed to go through the country too quickly. And I said to my wife, I'd like to do something where we kind of decide where we want to go. And I looked and looked, and I found this uh, company called uh, Odyssey Tours. Uh, and you design your own tour, basically. Three weeks is an extensive yeah. tour. R right. And you start out with saying, I want to see this, this, and this. And they say, OK, did you also know that there's this, this, and And so you go back and forth. And finally, you have a tour design that is completely what you want to do. And uh, the way they operate is pretty unique. Uh, you are met with a guide, a car, and a driver at your various locations in country. And it's just the two of you, my wife and I. So we had a very personalized uh, tour experience. You had different guides at different locations? Yes. Uh, okay. Between Vietnam and then we also went over to Cambodia for right. four days. Uh, between those two countries, we had uh, four guides that were with us all the time. And they would um, pick us up in the morning. We would uh, do a tour uh, or tours. And then by mid-afternoon, we were taken uh, back to the hotel. And we could do the rest of the day on our own, right. which we really find. We, we've spoken briefly before. Uh, you know that I'm a Vietnam veteran also. Sir. And so the rest of this interview will be of great interest to me <laughs> and to our viewers as well, we hope. Good. Um, Let's talk about the people. That's, that's an integral part of, of the experience. Tell us more. So uh, obviously, when I was there back in 68, I got uh, to know the area around Benoit and Saigon. But I was very interested in uh, going back and learning and uh, visiting more with people uh, in North Vietnam, the former oh, okay. enemy. So we started out in Hanoi. And I thought. Uh, I would never be standing in downtown Hanoi sure. as a visitor, as a tourist, um, taking in the many sights of, of the city and getting to know the people. Give our viewers your first impression. Vietnam is a country of 94, 94 million people in a country about the size of California. You Almost a third of our country. Uh, our United States population. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You cannot believe how many people there are uh, as far as density. That's the first impression. Okay, yeah. My second impression is all of those 94 million own a motor scooter. <laughs> and they are in the street. Uh, the lights are merely a suggestion. The crosswalker, they call it the zebra, uh -huh. it is nothing. Uh, you, you, you cross at your own will, and somehow, Jim, it's fascinating. It's like the waters part as you go through, and then it closes behind you. My wife was petrified the okay. whole time crossing the street. <laughs> I just said, well, this is the way it's supposed to be done, and by gosh, uh, they do it. But as you're walking down the sidewalk, the motor scooters will be coming at you, coming from behind you. 
Uh, to say they're ubiquitous is an understatement. Motor scooters are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And these are little tiny things, little 100, 125 uh, cc yeah. motor scooters. And uh, like I said, everybody's got one. And if they don't have one, uh, the family is riding together on it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was very common to see uh, four and five people on a little tiny uh, motor scooter mm -hmm. uh, propelling themselves uh, down the street. So that was my first impression. My gosh, a lot of people. Right. Second impression, there is no evidence of the war. None. Uh, it was 50 years later, and I told my wife, I suppose it's like uh, somebody that had been in World War II ended up in Germany in 1944 and decided to go back in 1994, right. 50 years right. later. The changes. And let's remember that most of the Vietnamese population had not been born, had not been born at that time. Excellent point. Uh, of the 94 million, some 75 or 80 percent were born after 1975 when the war right. ended. Mm -hmm. So a lot of young people, as a matter of fact, um, we saw very few people <laughs> my age, why, uh, why we were in country. And while we're talking about that, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that not once when I was introduced to somebody that had been there in, during the war, uh, was I ever challenged, was I ever uh, frowned upon, scorned at, um, n nobody, the, usually it was just okay. That was going to be one of my questions, but uh, we'll, we'll stay with that for a moment. Did you ever feel uneasy? No. Uh, and, and I must say that uh, I'm talking with some of my fellow uh, Vietnam vets about my trip over there. Uh, some of them were very clear. Uh, they would never go back. Sure. Their experiences were such, they're part of that 20% oh, sure. we talked about earlier, uh, that was pretty painful. And they want no uh, recollection. They want nothing mm -hmm. to bring back the memories. And I, I didn't have that. I didn't feel that way. So not once did I ever have any apprehension or any uh, misgivings mm -hmm. about going. One of the things you mentioned uh, before the interview was their interest in the English language. And you have some great stories. So um, three incidences, if sure. I might. The first one occurred, uh, my wife and I and the guide were touring a complex and she said, I think I'm just going to sit outside here while you go inside. So the guide and I are looking at something. And while she was outside, uh, a young Vietnamese woman came up and in very clear English said, do you mind if I practice my English with you? And my wife was kind of taken aback and she sure. said, why no, no, that's fine. So for about 15 minutes, they conversed back and forth and my wife found out that she uh, is a university student and she very much uh, wants to perfect her English sure. uh, to help her get a job. Mm -hmm. The second incident in Hanoi, uh, one afternoon we had come back from a tour and I said to my wife, well, uh, I want to go and see this lake that's nearby. In Hanoi they have numerous lakes throughout the city. And I went to this one that was uh, half a mile from the hotel, sat on a park bench and I'm sitting there enjoying everything. And three young women came up and one, in, in kind of broken English with a notepad said, pardon me, do you mind? if I practice my English with you, why my two friends uh, video it on a cell phone okay. so they can take it back to our class and show the students. So she and I went back and forth and very good at high school, high school level. And then the third incident, I um, went back to the base where I was assigned, Benoit, and we couldn't get on the base, but went to the end of the runway and the guide that I had, he was pretty forward. He knocked on a door and said, uh, we'd like to see the end of the runway here. And this introduced who I was. And while we were there, the owner of the house, lovely man and his wife said, would you talk English with our two high school uh, students right. or, or, or girls? Right. And so for about the next 15 minutes, uh, everything from do you have a boyfriend to what do you want to study, what do you want to be, um, how do you like living in Ben? I mean, we just went back and forth. It was unbelievable that 
uh, he, this is somebody knocking on your door asking to take oh, a look a great at the story. runway, and now you're ending up yeah. talking English with the yeah. two kids. Um, much more to cover. Uh, let's take a break, and we'll be right back. I went on a trip similar to this in 2015 out of Augusta, Georgia. And it was the first time I've seen the Vietnam Wall with veterans who were actually there. And it's a different experience for a vet to see that wall. And so I brought it up to Post 68 that we should do that for veterans in the area. Basically just went door to door to businesses in Brunswick County asking for support and contributions of any kind. Uh, we called on ATMC. They were uh, able to make a significant contribution. Some of my veteran experiences in other places wasn't that kind of support. And here, it's special. When you went through the different monuments, you felt like you were a part of that history, even though you are just there. I think it's very um, positive, very encouraging. Uh, there's a, a lot of distractions going on right now, politically and socially and otherwise, but at least you know that there's a, a portion of society that recognizes what the sacrifices were and recognizes them. What it means at least there's somebody that remembers what we did in World War II uh, and I appreciate the fact that if it wasn't for them I wouldn't be going on any of their trips. Uh, we're back with Colonel E. Gifford, Gifford Stack. Um, this has been such an interesting uh, interview and more to go. Um, I, I'm hoping you can give our viewers an idea of the countryside. Mm -hmm. Mountainous, uh, heavily treed, barren. Uh, describe the countryside if you could. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go back is I was aware that the geography of Vietnam uh, varies dramatically. You've got some of the finest beaches in the world um, and then you have this mountainous Central Highlands uh, terrain, mm -hmm. which a lot of the viewers may be familiar with because uh, places like Khe Sanh, famous battle, uh, were in that mm -hmm. kind of mountainous area as well as others. So we experienced everything from uh, China Beach in Da Nang, 26 miles of the whitest, most beautiful sand and ocean that you could imagine. And this is the famous China Beach where um, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the South Koreans, uh, the Americans, divided up by Air Force, Marines, Army. They had to keep them separate because when they went there, they all got feeling pretty frisky about who was the best or whatever. Right. <laughs> so they had to keep them separated. But now uh, there's none of that left. Is it a wonderful tourist area now? It is a beautiful tourist area. And some of the hotels across the street from the beach might be familiar to the viewers. Uh, Four Seasons, uh, Holiday Inn, the Marriott. It is truly a tourist destination. So that's the beach. And then we also uh, were able to visit um, areas like the Mekong Delta, which is this lush, sure. wonderful uh, rice growing area. It's called the breadbasket of Vietnam. Uh, very different. And we did not, on this uh, trip that we had, uh, go to the Central Highlands, but um, I, I know that that's beautiful, and there's a place up there called the Lot, which is actually the summertime vacation home for uh, many of the Vietnamese. That's a place that's uh, cool and uh, less humid in the summer, so a lot of people go to that area. So you've got this uh, wonderful geographical right. uh, divergence throughout the country. Let's talk about Western development because mm -hmm. there is plenty of it, right? I, this came home to me, Jim, when I was in Vietnam on this trip, and I said to my wife, you know, every piece of visible clothing that I have on is made in <laughs> Vietnam. And I thought, well, how ironic. <laughs> they produced it, mm -hmm. shipped it to the United States, I bought it, and now here I am wearing it back. So much, yeah. Um, the country is uh, filled from the north to the south with... Um, Fortune 500 companies? Absolutely. Uh, everybody from uh, Coca-Cola, to uh, country, uh, companies out of Japan and China and Korea. High, te high tech? 
very much high tech and these industrial parks that they have they're very proud of a region's industrial park because they specialize in something this is the one for clothing uh, this is the one for electronics this is the one for engines this is where they put scooters together mm -hmm. and soon I understand they'll be um, assembling automobiles as well so there is a tremendous amount of uh, industrialization that you notice uh, as a common tourist Wow. Then that leads me to this. Um, Vietnam is still a communist country. How, yeah. how do we explain this divergence? Yeah. The, the story that we were told is that um, after the war, after 1975, uh, they were obviously in close partnership with Russia and China. And then Russia, particularly um, in 1988 with the breakup of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. Uh, things got really bad. Um, the subsidies were gone, the support was gone, and we were told more than once uh, that this was really a rough period. Uh, they knew they had to do something, and one of the countries that they turned to was Singapore. Uh, and Singapore leadership came in and said, you know, we've cut ourselves off from Malaysia. We're not communists, but we one are... One of the great success stories in all the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And they said, you know, this would be the way that we would suggest uh, you go. And I think um, the leadership said, you know, let's do that. We are still going to have communism overriding everything that's done, but we will allow this, uh, I don't want to call it capitalistic, but we will allow this economic engine to grow. So it's top down with a, a huge do dose of capitalism. Yes, and a couple of sidebar stories, wherever we went, and we saw the uh, industrialization uh, close by, nearby, around, would always be a building or buildings that you could tell belonged to either the government or the party. Uh, you okay. could tell by the flags <clears throat> that they were flying. Were they, did they monitor? Or what? They were absolutely gorgeous. Uh, of all the buildings in Vietnam, these cream yellow, beautiful, vibrant red with gold lettering, okay. immaculate landscaping, that belonged to the party or to the government. And those buildings were very prominent, uh, pronounced. And the purpose the of those buildings or those within that building? The governmental entity. Uh, so you had the, the district offices or the province offices uh, that were there to make sure that- To the, oversee. That the um, Vietnamese governmental structure uh, re either remained in place or was operating properly. I see. Um, we've, we've touched on this, but, but not, as, not enough. Tourism mm. um, from all over the world. I was shocked. I didn't realize uh. that, uh, that tourism played such an important role to the economy of the country. I, for some reason, said, you know, agriculture, rice exporters, mm -hmm. uh, that, sure. that's where they're getting their uh, primary income. No, I, I, I don't know which is one and which is two, but I would say tourism is one of the one or two top economic producers for the country. Not just Asia, but all over the world. All over the world. Europe, Germans. We, we saw a lot uh, of Chinese. Okay. Uh, historically, there's been an association between China and Vietnam, so mm -hmm. they, sure. they are there in droves. Uh, Japanese, um, Koreans, Germans, Australians, Americans, and why we were there. Um, I read a newspaper article, a lot of English language newspapers in Vietnam now, so we try to read that mm -hmm. daily, but at, as of October, they had already surpassed in number of visitors in 2018, in October, the entire amount of visitors they had in 2017. So they still had a, a, a couple of months to go, and yeah. they were uh, off the chart now. Um, we saw Vietnamese who spoke fluent uh, German, Chinese, Italian, Russian. They take languages very seriously. Okay. Okay. But the number one language that everybody wants to learn is English. Sure. English. And whether it be the bellboy at the hotel or somebody in a small little restaurant, they knew English. Uh, did, you, did you enjoy the foods? Uh, speaking of restaurants, yes, I enjoyed the food a lot. Um, 
So when we got up in the morning, the hotel would offer a, a buffet. Every hotel we stayed at offered a buffet. And it was kind of unusual because they had to make uh, food that was suitable to the tourists that they had. And if we stayed at a place where there were a lot of Japanese or mm -hmm. uh, okay. Russians, you, you saw that uh, food, their foods, sure. on the buffet. So we had uh, a lot of experience sampling that. And then at lunch, uh, where the tour company always took us to a restaurant that featured foods from that area and if we were on the coast obviously seafood if we were somewhere else it'd be a beef or pork dish that was especially to them and uh, we ate a lot of Vietnamese uh, meals and every single one of them Jim was absolutely wonderful I wish we could get some of them to come to Brunswick County and open up <laughs> a restaurant right. they were delicious absolutely delicious and um, your viewers might be interested who are thinking of going there. Food and hotels are some of the least expensive things in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it's not only good, but it's a good value. You mentioned that your wife traveled with you. Uh, if she were here today, what, what comment or two would she make? She would obviously say, at our age, we're mid-70s, uh, that this is not an easy tour to take. Okay, uh, A sure. lot of the places that you it's go a lengthy to, tour. It, we were a little over two weeks, uh, as I said, in Vietnam, and then four days in Cambodia. And you have to be physically fit. Uh, I will mm -hmm. be honest with you, the tour that we took, um, people with uh, handicap, any kind of disability, would find it impossible. Uh, and there aren't a lot of accommodations for handicap, either access or ability. So that quite hasn't caught up yet, but if any mm -hmm. of the viewers uh, who have that, uh, it would be almost impossible, I think, to, uh, to, to, to go and enjoy it. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of a wonderful interview. Uh, from one veteran to another, let's remind our viewers of the availability of veteran services right here in Brunswick County. We are absolutely blessed with having a wonderful Veteran Affairs office right. in the Bun Brunswick County uh, complex, governmental complex in Bolivia. Anita Hartzell is the head of that, and I've had uh, the opportunity to work with her, and she is such a font of knowledge about the um, opportunities, about the things that Vietnam veterans have available to them, everything from uh, support groups to how to file a claim mm -hmm. for a disability uh, with the Veterans Administration. They are not part of the Veterans Administration. They're completely autonomous part of uh, Brunswick County government. Right, absolutely. And I would say to any viewer, especially a Vietnam vet, that hasn't made contact yet <clears throat> with the Veterans Services Office, uh, Anita Hartzell, uh, in the government complex to do so, I think they would find it uh, extremely beneficial. Absolutely. Let's urge our, our viewers that are veterans to do that uh, yes. as soon as possible. Colonel E. Gifford Stack, thank you for a wonderful interview. Thank you, Jim, and welcome home. Thanks so much. Giving Garden is actually uh, an old premise, but uh, probably more prevalent nowadays where there's such a focus on income redistribution or income disparities, uh, but also recognizing how many people are food insecure. The responsibility of uh, many folks is that we really should be tr trying to provide for school children particularly to make sure that they have enough food to eat. It's also the 25th anniversary of the Southport Oak Island Kiwanis Club, and we wanted to have a signature project to mark that. And uh, Giving Garden was a good way to do it. It's a program that costs a lot up front, but over the next 10 to 15 years, we'll be able to provide a lot of food over the years, uh, or a lot of fresh vegetables uh, organically, uh, and uh, provide it to the various uh, food pantries and uh, those who distribute through churches. Through Brunswick County, we have over 20 food pantries that are receiving some sort of food assistance, where at one point it was just emergency, and now we're seeing routine. And we're talking about a thousands of families. So the Giving Garden is one way that we can uh, provide those nutrient-dense foods to more families in need. We do over 40 projects a year and even though we have over 100 members it takes a lot of money raising to be able to support those programs. Getting a grant from a local corporation like ATMC is really helpful because it lets us make our funds go farther. We can do more projects and we can do bigger projects. That way.
Thank you for being with us on Our Hometown. If you have a story you'd like to share, please get in touch with us at atmctv.com. Thanks again for being with us and join us again soon on Our Hometown. Mm -hmm.